And so here we go. Uh, to start with, um, so this is the, the CLF um, Embodied Carbon Roundtable. And um, this morning, so these are typically quarterly meetings and we're considering making them a little bit uh, closer together, but, um, but not burdensome and, and probably not um, as often as a monthly meeting yet. The, um, the CLF, the Embodied Carbon Roundtable has these objectives. First of all, we want to share news, strategic plans, resources, and tools related to embodied carbon. And we invite, uh, it's not strictly speaking just in, um, NGO or nonprofit organizations. We also have a few representatives from government or policy organizations and, um, and even one or two uh, for-profit companies that have really nonprofit missions um consultancies and so on and so our purpose is to to uh also to report planning and future dates for conferences and webinars and meetings uh, to inspire and facilitate ongoing communication and conversation uh, that pulls in key leaders related to embodied carbon in the building industry and then finally we want to, to really strongly encourage convergence on shared uh embodied carbon terminology data standards benchmarks and targets for uh, reducing embodied carbon. And um, so we've got a, a few new members um, each month, each uh, each meeting who join us for this uh, for this gathering. Um, it's been this meeting has now been going on for about two and a half years since the fall of, of 2019. First of all, the first meeting was in person and since since then it's been a virtual meeting and we've got attendees from other parts of the world. Um, probably the newest uh, members are um, uh, from an organization in Sydney, Australia, and they were not able to join us this morning, but they plan to either, I mean, it's like two o'clock in the morning or some horrible thing like that in Australia at the moment, but they're planning to either, um, either try to attend once in a while or to send a, a short video uh, giving all of the rest of us an update. Of, of what, what they're doing um, in Mecla in, in Sydney. So to start with, uh, we've got Megan Lewis. And by the way, uh, we, have, we have a remarkable situation inside, C inside CLF at the moment. We have three people from the CLF staff who are all named Megan. And all on this call. So we should all and, raise our hands. So and all, all on this call, there they are. <laughs> And I and I am seriously considering changing my name to Megan because <laughs> I don't want anybody to feel that they're left out or that that, that they're dissed in any way. Um, so we're actually going to start out with Megan Lewis uh, from the CLF staff, who has a, a a fantastic announcement to make and a little bit of a report on a project that she and a couple of others from our staff have been working on. So, Megan, why don't you lead us off? Thanks, Andrew. Uh -uh. Oh, can you oh. let me screen share? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I, I was supposed to do that earlier. Um, and I want to make, I want everybody to know that um, as um, as I reach your name in the list of people who are going to be presenting, I'll make you this, the co-presenter just in case you wanted to share your screen as well. And also, um, now, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, by the way, um, as you make a report, if you've got a website or a web page, um, a link to share, put that in the chat window and your link in the chat window will be part of the notes of the meeting. So go ahead, Megan. All right, thanks. Um, I just wanted to share a, a quick overview to entice you all to look at our new report um, that we just put up, put up on the website uh, with C, in collaboration with C40 and um, so a little bit more about this, what we see a gap where cities are increasingly interested in passing embodied carbon policies, and it can be difficult to communicate the potential of these policies, um, especially in comparison to policies that we um, have been working on for a longer time in the decarbonization space. And so our long-term goal is to establish a simple calculator for planners, policymakers, others to model the carbon savings potentials of policies for a specific city uh, and allow a comparison of different types of embodied carbon reduction policies to look at what the emissions impact could be by key dates, so 2030, 2050. Um, and then 
it, really with the goal of helping them evaluate and prioritize policies to be able to reach our goals more quickly because we don't have the luxury of time to test out a lot of different things and see what see what works. So um, we did a proof of concept and I will use that word a lot. Again, proof of concept. This is not a, you know, this is a beta tool um, where with, with C40 in a couple of pilot cities. Um, and we started with these four policies. We looked at um, policies that re require reduction in building carbon intensity. So ones that would set limits on the uh, uh, the GWP per square foot or per meter per square meter. We looked at um, ones that require reductions in concrete carbon intensity, um, policies that incentivize adaptive reuse. And then this last one, we ended up shifting a little bit over the um, span of the project. And I think in the in the future would look a little different, but we were looking at what the impact of housing unit size uh, is on embodied carbon. And so uh, for all of these, just to give you a sense of what this is sort of what a, one of the interfaces would look like, there is the, you know, the policy that you're looking at, and then you enter projected growth data for the city. So for this pilot, um, we did the work of finding all of that projected data for the cities. Um, so we worked with New York, city of New York, uh, city of Portland, and then we looked at one neighborhood in the city of Austin. And I looked at their projected growth in terms of new construction, building size, building type to 2050, um, and then played around with setting different percentage reduction requirements um, that there is more meaning behind them. But again, you're going to have to look at this really long report because I got to respect Andrew's five minute rule. Um, and then you're able to see a baseline scenario in terms of what the emissions would have been without um, these type of policies and reductions, and then a, a reduction scenario and then total savings. And so this is an example of for the city of New York, um, looking at that first, the uh, requiring carbon intensity reductions at the building scale, what that looks like. So a baseline scenario, um, a 10% reduction requirement. So in line with lead, a 40% reduction requirement, just focusing on multifamily. So it's another thing we played around with look, looking at different um, building types. So if you were to focus just on residential construction versus commercial construction, because um, as we know, a lot of times policies will start with commercial construction or they'll start with, you know, just government buildings. Um, and then, and then, you know, for all of them, we have a sort of most aggressive scenario. So all the building types that were included in the data set and, um, and a larger reduction. And, and we were also trying to align with different targets to help um, illustrate what that could look like. So the World Green Building Council target, the clean construction uh, declaration target. Um, and so we have that for each of those policies. And then there is a pilot or a case study for each of the cities that we looked at, um, looking across these calculators and, and what the potential reductions were. Um, again, this is a proof of concept. So one of the things that um, we think is really important that we're going to be doing as soon as we have additional funding to expand and go into next steps for the tool is um, there's some tool functionality pieces first. So uh, one of the things you'll notice is that on the graphs that I showed, it's a simple line going up. That's obviously not typically how policies are set up. They tend to be stepped. So uh, looking at things like uh, increased uptake over time, changing those percentage reduction requirements over time, um, including infrastructure and parking was feedback we, we got from um, the cities we work with that would be really important that we'd want to see included. Uh, the time value of carbon and nonlinear growth, both really important. So can we include in the calculator the importance of reducing carbon now? Because that would kind of change some of the, um, especially the policies that are easier to pass now. How does that interact um, with, the, um, with the total carbon reductions? Uh, de including demolition impacts and then interaction between scenarios. So if you pass all four of those, for example, the total emissions reductions would not be as large because there's overlap between them. Um, and then the three big data gaps that we want to improve in the next phase is, first of all, uh, better building embodied carbon intensity data across all calculators. I think this is the biggest asterisk that we want to put on the results of this, is that this is a proof of concept for how this calculator could be more powerful in the future. But we're working with not granular enough data to be really confident about bragging about those specific numbers. Like right now, this is showing the potential um, of the future tool once we're able to get more granular numbers. Um, and, and I'll flag that we are 
starting to work on um, better building benchmarks um, with our whole building LCA pilot study that we're kicking off. Um, so I'll put both of these links in the chat. And then um, other data that we're going to be looking to improve in the next one is better city data on building size. That was, we were able to, to find a lot on floor area projections, but not in terms of the granular sort of mid-size high rise, um, et cetera, for, for all cities. And then construction type. So making sure that we're being accurate with our assumptions about what the baseline is for concrete, steel, uh, wood construction, et cetera, for um, four different cities. Um, so with that, I'll just, this is uh, up on our website now. There is a shorter piece that goes into the framework of how we calculated each of these four and has those, um, the example interfaces with what cities would have to input into the tool and then what they would get out. Uh, the case studies, so each of them has results for each of the specific policies, as well as a summary of the feedback that we received from cities, which was really helpful. Um, short version, they thought it would be useful. We were very excited. Uh, and then a really long detailed methodology section, if you'd like to nerd out on that part, as well as the future research and opportunities. So I will stop sharing my screen and pass it off to the next uh, NGO update. Great. Thanks uh, so much, Megan. And at the risk of confusing everybody, I'll introduce yet another Megan from CLF. Megan Byrne is our new, the newest member of our staff, or one of the newest members of our staff. And she's going to tell you all a, a bit about, um, actually, um, right after Megan, or maybe along with Megan, Webley Bowles from, um, from uh, the New Building Institute is on the on the call as well. Megan Byrne, please, please uh, first uh, tell us uh, hello and who you are and what you're doing and what you're uh, going to talk about a little bit about the uh, new buildings, um, 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 the net zero week uh, that, that Webley can help tell us about. Um, and by the way, anybody who's new, to, uh, any new participants or pe people who are now just joining the meeting, please make a point of putting your name and the organization that you're representing or, or a part of into the chat window as well. And Megan Lewis, would you please also put a, a link to that set of slides um, in the chat window? So Megan Byrne, go ahead. Hi, I'm Megan. Um, like Andrew just said, I joined CLF about a month ago um, as the engagement and communications lead. And so um, part of what I'm going to be working on is helping CLF and the regional hubs kind of um, be able to get our name out and increase our communication and engagement and presence online. And um, next month, we are going to be working with the New Buildings Institute on their Net Zero Buildings Promotion Week, um, which is a, yeah, thank you for putting that link in there, um, a social media campaign to increase awareness and um, access to uh, resources about um, carbon neutral buildings and getting to zero. Um, and so we are looking to um, see if anybody would be interested in joining our social media campaign and providing any um, either specific people who can be net zero heroes or any resources or reports that they would be interested in having highlighted on our LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, you can see in the link that Webley shared, there's some more information and I'll be sending out an email with some um, examples and ideas for how you can participate um, next week. But yeah, if anybody's interested, let me know and we can definitely work on some um, social media posts and ideas to um, share resources on net zero buildings. Great, Thank a lot. thanks a lot, Megan Byrne. And Webley, you're on the call as well. Would you uh, please add anything that you'd like to add to what Megan Byrne just said and then um, tell us uh, what else uh, NBI is up to. Sure. So, um, yeah, net, net Zero Buildings Week is really exciting. It's really just promotion. You don't necessarily have to create new content. What we're trying to do is to reach the middle majority to just spread the word about Net Zero. And we're using the term Net Zero because it is very broad. It means a lot of different things. And even if you're just interested in promoting sustainability, it's a great way to promote your work, promote other people's work, promote the people that hold the solutions to solving our building problem. And 
really just try to spread this message and reach more people with it. So it's kind of as complex or as simple as you want to make it. If you just want to send out a couple of tweets, if you want to do a whole webinar that week, um, there's a variety of options. You can participate however you want and sign up at the link and we'll be sending out more information about it. So that is um, Net Zero Building Week. I have a really exciting announcement. Um, so yesterday, the Denver Green Code adopted our embodied carbon requirements for concrete and steel. So that was a big success. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we also presented at um, IBC, so International Building Code, and we're going to be moving forward with putting that through public comment. So that's kind of our next step. And what we're going to need there is people to show up in Louisville, um, Tennessee, that's where it is, <laughs> on September 21st. So if you are in the region and you are interested in supporting our code language for the International Building Code, I can share that with you and we'd love to coordinate. So I'll throw my email in the chat. And if that's something that you're interested in, we would love your support. Um, <clears throat> other embodied carbon um, code news, we submitted to Washington State for concrete and steel as well. So uh, I forget the timeline on that exactly, but we'll be um, promoting that a little bit more as we get up to um, defending that. And then we're continuing to work on different materials and understanding how we can get those into the building code as well. So that's um, kind of next up. So just keep it short and sweet today, Andrew. But big news. Great. That's that's fantastic news. Thank you so much, Webley. It'll be, um, believe it or not, news on news of that level makes my entire day. <laughs> it's great. Um, and Patrick uh, Langevin, is that the way that I pronounce your name? I don't want to mispronounce it, please. Can, can that works. Yeah, Langevin okay. or Langevin. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, flexible. <laughs> okay, Langevin. I'll, I'll do my best anyway. Uh, from uh, Natural Resources Canada. Uh, uh, tell us what's happening up there. Sure. So I've got uh, a short presentation uh, that I can um, that I can share. I uh, just wanted to give folks an update um, on a tool that we're working on. Um, and maybe just a little bit of an update on what's happening in Canada. I don't know if folks can see the screen. Yes. Um, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So I think Andrew told me I had uh, two to three or two to four minutes. So I'm going to keep this uh, brief. Um, so we are working on a, a material carbon emissions estimator tool. Um, I've been working on it actually with Chris Magwood, who's on the call today. Um, I heard the word uh, pilot or um, beta. I think that we're very much in that mode. Um, and I think uh, the idea behind this tool is really to open up a conversation with the Canadian home building industry. So I'm part of Natural Resources Canada. I'm on a team called the Local Energy Efficiency Partnerships. Uh, we work closely with uh, home builders across the country. Uh, and this is an issue that's been emerging over the last few years. And so we thought uh, we would put something together as it relates to and it responds to some of the objectives that we do have around uh, codes and where we're going from a carbon perspective in Canada. So it is going to be a free tool. Um, we're very close to launch. Uh, I know Chris launched his his tool very, very recently. Um, and there's there's certainly some synergies between the two tools, but it's going to be a free tool uh, that it's going to help the home building industry here in Canada um, to understand the first carbon impacts of, of their homes. Um, and really help to inform some product selection along the way. Uh, what does our calculator do that's different than, than some of the other tools that are out there in the market? So from a, from a Government of Canada perspective, we have this other piece of software called HA2000, which is the backbone of all of the energy modeling that we do in Canada. Um, and so this tool essentially is a, is a bolt-on or a plug-in that goes on the side of HOT 2000 and it allows uh, energy advisors and builders uh, to understand what the total, well, get an estimate of what the total carbon impact is of their, of their homes. It really only deals with A1 to A3 um, and then the, the operational side of things. Uh, because we're in Canada, we do everything, uh, it takes us twice as long uh, because we have to do everything twice. So it is going to be available in both uh, French and English um, for those who are interested. Um, in terms of what it looks like, it's a very simple uh, Excel spreadsheet. Um, so again, this idea of, of getting out there with something, getting, getting a conversation starter. Um, 
And it, it essentially, like I said, it, it connects to HOT 2000. So HOT 2000 is an energy simulation tool. It allows you to import certain data points from HOT 2000. Uh, so the, the energy consumption, whether it's electricity, natural gas, or other fuels. Uh, and then it, it essentially plots out the operational carbon and allows you to go through a process of looking at um, at the uh, embodied emissions uh, as a result. Uh, so this just gives you a sense of, of the kinds of data inputs, fairly typical um, from, a, from a construction perspective. So uh, it pulls certain data in from HOT 2000 and where that data isn't available, uh, it's up to the user to plug it in. Uh, and then similar to what Chris is doing on Beam, uh, it allows you to go through a, a series of tabs uh, that, that essentially allow you to build the house from the ground up. Uh, and then it and then it gives you um, some data with regards to how your project uh, performs from from both an operational as well as an embodied perspective. Um, this here is is a plot that just kind of emphasizes the importance of of looking at this from a from a Canadian perspective. Uh, so this is a high performance home, fairly typical home uh, that we that we put into the tool, and we, we're ending up with over seventy tons of carbon when you when you do the calculation. Uh, and from an operational perspective, uh, and I wanted to put this one in in French just to give it a more international flavor. Um, but from an operational perspective, we're only over thirty years we're we're going to emit uh, less than a ton of carbon. And so this really, from an industry perspective, this really uh, brings home the importance of looking at the whole picture when it comes to carbon. Uh, it gives you a bit of a top 10. Uh, and I had some analysis, I'm gonna skip right through it. Uh, in Canada, we have, you have the international building code, we have the national building code. Uh, we've just gone through a major update. Um, and I guess the, the bottom line with this tool is it's gonna allow industry to drive insights uh, into the carbon performance of buildings um, that they didn't have access to before. Uh, so if we look at the, the current uh, building code, so this is in Ontario, uh, a home built uh, in Ontario is going to, over the course of 30 years, is going to emit um, roughly 160 tons of carbon, however you build it. Uh, and as we go towards these higher performing levels of energy performance and carbon performance, we ultimately want to be looking for that pathway that gets us down to that to that lowest energy uh, or energy and carbon performance. So the two of them really go hand in hand. Uh, we are gonna be posting it on our website within the next month. Uh, like I said, we've got to do everything twice. So it takes us twice as long. And we're gonna be working to develop a, a two hour workshop that uh, will be delivered uh, with a number of our industry partners here in Canada. So we have the Canadian Association of Certified Energy Advisors. Um, and then we're going to be working with the home building industry uh, writ large to get this tool out into the hands of the industry. It will be posted on our website. I can drop this into the chat so that people can have a look at, uh, at it when it comes out. And um, I think that's pretty much it. So thank you, Andrew, for inviting me along to this meeting and uh, really uh, excited and happy to be part of this, uh, part of this uh, forum. So thank you. Anybody have any questions? Thanks so much, uh, Patrick. Patrick, as a matter of fact, it, it strikes me that it would be appropriate and helpful to have Chris Mag Magwood uh, go next and follow you directly because he's got a similar and a partner announcement, I think, about, I think about the Beam tool. Is that right, Chris? Are you muted? Sorry, yes, I'm muted. Um, I just want to start my update. Uh, it's great to follow Patrick because, uh, you know, the, the work at Enercan and the work at Builders for Climate Action has been uh, happening in parallel for, for quite a while now. And uh, it's really great to see him. He's been a super strong advocate for embodied carbon uh, at Enercan, and I'm really glad that he's here. Um, I just want to start my update by uh, updating my hat switch. <laughs> um, some of you know this, but some of you don't, but um, in uh, February, uh, I took a position on the really great embodied carbon team at RMI. And so I will be, uh, this will be my last time here wearing my uh, Builders for Climate Action hat, and uh, I will start to uh, be wearing my RMI hat. But a lot has happened at Builders for Climate Action since the last meeting, so um, we'll catch you up on that. So yeah, as Patrick mentioned, uh, our, our tool Beam 
um, which is also a spreadsheet tool. So the two tools were kind of developed uh, really in parallel. Um, they work from the same EPD database. They work to the same methodology. Um, for all intents and purposes, you should uh, get the, the same answers if you put in the same materials. Um, but um, so I won't actually talk too much about the tool because Patrick did a, a great job of laying out sort of uh, who it's aimed at and what it's for and, and how it works. Um, the difference with Beam is that um, it has, you know, Canadian focused materials, but it also um, uh, includes a whole bunch of US specific materials as well. So kind of um, making the, the same tool more accessible to, uh, to the, the wider North American market. Um, <clears throat> mostly what I was hoping to talk about quickly is that uh, we've been using the beta versions of this tool for three uh, really great studies about uh, embodied carbon in residential buildings. And I just wanted to give you a really high level summary uh, of those studies. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot to the studies as there always is, but, but to summarize them at the highest level, um, when we started Builders for Climate Action, uh, we did a study of some model buildings and sort of showed a Worst case scenario um, that ended up being 346 kilograms uh, uh, of uh, emissions per square meter. We did a study um, with Enercan of 190 model homes across the country in which kind of the worst result was uh, higher than that. It was about 513. The most two recent studies we've done, uh, we're excited about them because they're, they're, they were done on as-built homes, not models. So we're actually using um, real plans from buildings that have actually been built in the last uh, couple of years. So in the cities of Nelson and Castlegar in British Columbia, we looked at 34 homes there and uh, found a, a highest result of 309 kilograms uh, per square meter. And in Toronto, we did a, a quite a large study, 503 as-built homes. And the, the worst result there was uh, 561. What was really interesting about all of these studies is how close the, uh, the averages uh, actually align to be. So you can sort of see um, a couple of the studies, uh, the average is 150 per meter squared and uh, our white paper and the Toronto region was a little bit higher, but um, gives us a pretty strong sense that uh, we, can, we can start to say with some certainty uh, that there is a, a reasonable uh, middle ground or uh, a place if somebody uh, in a city wanted to start picking a benchmark that we have a pretty good sense of where that benchmark lies. And then we had some interesting results in terms of what if we use the best available materials. The first two studies, those were again, uh, theoretical models, but uh, on the ground, there were um, a couple of really great um, examples where people were quite a bit lower than the, than the average uh, with their as-built buildings. And in our models, we had some really outstanding results, which are kind of based on um, Endeavor Center buildings. So they're theoretical results, but based on buildings that we've built. So we know that that's possible. Um, but this result here in Nelson uh, was really exciting to find an as-built home, uh, you know, being done and not necessarily even being done to be a low carbon house. See, those materials were sort of chosen for lots of other reasons, but that building came pretty close to having uh, a zero carbon footprint uh, on the materials side. So what we've kind of been able to take away from, from all these studies, so we've now got um, about 1300 buildings in beam. So it's starting to feel like, you know, we're, we're getting a pretty good sense of where all of this stuff lies. Um, if this really is the average uh, emissions from, from low rise homes, uh, in Canada, we're looking at them being responsible for eight to 10 million tons of emissions a year. Uh, and in the US, somewhere between 45 and 55 million tons. So it feels, it's not, that was gonna say it feels good. It doesn't feel good, but it feels like, you know, we can now go to policymakers and, and sort of make the case that uh, this is a sector that, that, uh, that has a real impact and needs to be addressed. Um, but I think, for me, the exciting part that came out of these studies is that none of the homes here were attempting to be low carbon homes. So in the case of the Toronto region study, uh, this builder who got this 116, um, that's a tract builder, builds about 400 homes a year. 
not attempting to make low carbon homes, but that their business as usual practice is already 40% better than the average in, in that region. And here in Nelson, same thing. We had a, you know, a, a professional builder building a home, not intending to make it a low carbon home where they're beating the average by 50%. And to me, that just means, you know, we can really uh, understand how much low hanging fruit there is here if people who aren't even trying to reduce the carbon footprint of these homes are, are you know, halving the carbon footprint. Um, there's no reason that the majority of the sector can't get there fairly quickly. So I think that's really encouraging. And all of these studies included taking some of the model homes or not model homes, the as-built homes and making some material substitutions to them uh, in beam. And so this is from the Toronto region study. So this was one of the homes with a, a higher carbon footprint from that study. And we looked at, you know, what if we got the best available concrete for that region? What if we switched out uh, some insulation materials, uh, cellulose and wood fiberboard? What if we got away from some of the brick cladding and went to engineered wood? What if we went to best in category flooring and drywall? And, you know, we're seeing on that model a 75% reduction available from a very small and affordable number of, um, of uh, product switches and, you know, getting, getting the carbon footprint of, of that same house down uh, to a really uh, respectable number uh, without, you know, any real change to, to, uh, to business as usual practices. Last sort of interesting thing that came out of the study is that when we start applying these best available materials, it didn't seem to matter where the home started. If we kind of made these five substitutions uh, across the board, we would get to pretty much the same answer for every house. So, um, you know, here we're starting with a house that, that had a way smaller carbon footprint than the first one. But when we make these material switches, it doesn't end up that much better than the, than the one that it started high. So that, that, that we can really drive to a, a best practice in, in this industry right now, you know, that, that somewhere in the sort of 50 to 70 kilograms per square meter range instead of the 150 to 190 that seems to be uh, the average now. Um, I think I will uh, kind of, I'm just going to skip through this because I'm probably going to take too long. Um, I'll put it in the in the uh, in the chat, but uh, you can find the studies and the link to Beam at the Builders for Climate Action um, uh, link here on the left. And I'm sure Bruce is going to talk about this, but our uh, Build Beyond Zero book just came out, so uh, there's a link to it there. And I probably went a little bit over Andrew. I'm sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> the best speed talking I could do. That was great, Chris. I'm I'm actually just enraged with uh, your going over the budget there. But <laughs> actually, what I want to do is take this opportunity to say, Bruce, would you please say hello? And I want to really point out this new book that Bruce and, and Chris have coming out. Bruce, could you just uh, say something about the book? Thanks, Andrew, and good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, it's uh, Chris and I are really excited about it. Uh, we spent the pandemic writing a book, which I highly recommend. Next pandemic comes around, sit down and write a book. I know the I know the authors personally. I can give you a personal recommendation. I've read their previous books. I do too, and at least one of them is a really great guy. Really, at um, least one of them. I can't remember which one, but yes. yeah. Um, and I forget what the cover price is. Um, I think it's 50 bucks, but you can get a 30% discount. I put it in the chat by ordering it from... Uh, Chris, you gave him a web link, right? To where to order it. We should put it up in the chat, but, and you can get 30% off if you uh, order it using in co uh, capital letters webinar as a discount yeah. code. Uh, we're very happy with it. And, and of course, the, everything is changing so fast. So there's a whole bunch of things that I think both of us would rewrite if we could, but that's how things move, right? It's fast. And, it, and it's a central message that I keep call me a broken record but um we got to shoot beyond zero folks we're not trying to get to zero we're trying to go way past zero not because it's a whole bunch more extra work that everybody has to do because this is more fun this is going to create a world our children can live in zero isn't where we're going thanks yeah. that's a great slogan and uh we're going to continue that slogan with uh kaylee howd uh from um who's one of the steering committee, committee members for the MEP 2040 commitment um, 
Kaylee, uh, if you would tell us uh, what is the commitment and and say something about the the recent um, the first quarterly roundtable that we had for the commitment. And I'll, by the way, I'll tell I'll tell everybody that as of this morning, there are now thirty nine uh, MEP engineering firms um, who have signed up for the commitment, uh, and our first um, international participants in the initiative, including um, a company in Hanoi, in, in, Hono, in, excuse me, in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and a couple in Spain. So we're beginning to expand outside of North America. Go ahead, Kaylee. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, this commitment started about a year ago. We officially launched in October of last year, had our first forum in March of this year, which went very, very well. At that point, I think we had uh, 27 signatories, um, but that meeting was all about just setting the scene for the challenge and making sure that everyone was on board with the, the four tenets that we'd put together, which were first and foremost, um, creating a company plan so that you had a plan of action to follow to reduce MEP embodied carbon and whole life carbon. Um, refrigerants, really taking a good hard look at that since we know that's a huge area for impact reduction. Um, in the embodied and operational carbon space for MEP. Um, also looking really hard at EPDs and manufacturers and just the lack thereof in the industry for MEP products. So, um, and then the fourth tenet of the challenge is to be a part of a growing body of knowledge around MEP um, whole life carbon. So that forum went very well. We have since then broken out into our working groups, which meet every two weeks. We have four of them. Um, and this next forum that's coming up June 9th, which hopefully Andrew can share the link to in the chat, got a little uh, registration link up here um, for us to be able to join that forum. But this will be working group updates from those four groups. The first one is on manufacturers and EPDs. So we are starting to lean heavily toward what uh, the UK did with SIBZ TM65 method. It's something that ASHRAE is working on actively with us to come up with basically an in lieu EPD for the many, many MEP products that don't have them. So we'll be talking about that as well as our data analysis and reporting group. We have a beta version of a refrigerant tool in place to help us understand the impact of refrigerants, um, which when we were doing our initial studies are a huge chunk of the embodied carbon of a building, up to half that of the structure. It's a big deal for something that is you would think quantity-wise very small, um, and also collaborating, collaborating with AIA DDX in the first instance to report refrigerants, not necessarily all of MEP in body carbon, but just refrigerants since we know they have a large impact, uh, as well as the partnerships group, which is working with teams like Mindful Materials for us to be able to um, make our voice heard across other platforms important in this space, not just the embodied carbon space and communications and resources. Uh, like Andrew mentioned, we're up to 38 signatories and 21 supporters. Um, and Andrew also put together a great page of kind of um, testimonies for different firms and why they joined and what they're hoping their impact will be. So it's been going very well and would really encourage all of you to join the next forum that we're having. Great, thanks so much, Kaylee. Um, and now we have, we've got Monica Hen from uh, from ULI, and I think that there are some, some exciting things happening in the world of UL, ULI as well. Uh, so could you please uh, take it on? Hello, yes, hi, thanks everyone, great to be here. Um, I just have a quick update on a couple of items that we're working on. So embodied carbon, I think, is becoming a much larger focus for a lot of our global boards. We're really excited to see so many of our senior members thinking about the topic of embodied carbon. And I think to kind of kick things off, we're gonna be focused on um, a topic or a, a piece of ULI that I think we're really, um, is kind of our bread and butter, I guess. So we're doing a convening or we're gonna be planning a convening for senior real estate leaders, as well as the um, general contractors and development side of things. So we're gonna be trying to bring different groups together and stakeholders to talk about how they can better work together and align for uh, reducing embodied carbon. And then I also have a colleague who is working on a building materials report. Um, it will partly cover embodied carbon, but also be a large focus on building materials and health. 
Um, so trying to really bring all of those three items together. So if you have any resources, ideas on how kind of all of those three things work in tandem, please feel free to send them to me. We'd love to kind of include those resources in the research. Great, thank you so much, Monica. And now uh, next on the agenda, we've got Debbie White. What, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce this. I'm pretty sure Debbie Whale or Weil or Wheel. It's Weil. Weil, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I think I just haven't waked up this morning or need my second cup of coffee or something like that. But so um, Debbie, tell us what's happening um, in the world of, of uh, WRI. Well, I, uh, I was hoping to have some project updates. I actually am going to defer to the next time when we've had a bit more development. There's some really interesting stuff going on in California in particular around um, the possibility of um, uh, coupling, look, looking at the industry side, on the industry side at cement plants and, and um, uh, sort of carbon utilization over there and, and sort of how that contributes into the embodied carbon conversation. But again, I'm going to table it for the next time. So I'll cede my time to whoever comes next. Thanks, right. Andrew. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, appreciate that time. We've got uh, Luca um, all the way here from Switzerland. Uh, Luca, tell us uh, what's happening with the World B Business Council for Sustainable Development. Yeah, thanks. So I just quickly also bring up maybe first I want to just maybe uh, can you see the slide? Yes, yep, we can see it. So this is actually because I wanted to share that we have a new strategy as WBCSD, which will drive the next kind of five years of work. But what we have is also that we have like uh, divided like uh, our work into the different systems. Uh, which we call pathways and the built environment is one of them. So that's where our, all our work uh, is feeding in, but also well across the different imperatives, uh, which are kind of the main uh, uh, sustainability challenges that there is. So the climate, the nature and inequality as a priority to be addressed. So uh, of course the work they're doing on the decarbonization and circularity fits well in the climate, but also uh, especially circularity in the nature. And we also have more work on nature. So this is kind of just a, to maybe in a in a one slide say what is WBCSD and how we work, because this is will drive as well the engagement we have across the different uh, uh, activities. So this is a busy slide, but it just wanted to maybe just highlight how all the work that we're doing, uh, how it makes what it means uh, a, a systemic across the built environment, and this is really kind of of course there is the material work on how to help decarbonization, and that's. Uh, work on reducing embodied carbon, but what we do is very much a, a, a all life carbon uh, work and really focusing the all life carbon and how we decarbonize the built environment. So by reaching the goal is to halve emission by 2030 and at zero by 2050. So, but we want to address the kind of the challenges that are the hotspot of carbon emission of the embodied carbon and operational carbon across the different uh, main segment of the value chain and as mentioned before my colleague sarah she was also very much focused on the embodied carbon um on the finance aspect so the next slide was this one about uh how what we do in the all life carbon so we have quite a few activity that focus on the all life carbon and when i say all life carbon is because definitely we have been focusing a lot of our work recently on embodied carbon a few publication but we always try to say is we cannot just address embodied carbon. We really make, need to make sure that we address embodied carbon in the context of the all life carbon. So, uh, but yeah, most of our work as well, we did it was on embodied carbon. And what we do as well is to provide more data about all life carbon and the all life carbon case study in buildings, uh, showing what is the role and influencing power of architect, engineering, and construction company to, to address all life carbon reduction. We will have a new publication on how to lower embodied carbon, role of digitalization and standardization of uh, all life carbon and the improving the data quality. So this is a kind of a various activity that we have and uh, of each one of them, I probably could spend quite some time, but I, I don't think that's the purpose. I just wanted to share our resources that then providing in one overview, uh, the main resources we had on the decarbonization, like starting from the building system carbon framework, we had the case study on uh, net zero building, where do we stand? 
uh, with six case study of all life carbon and embodied carbon report for decarbonizing construction more focusing on investor and developer uh, where monica as well was in, engaged and col collaborating from ULI. and then yeah here is the publication on how to lower embodied carbon really tackling how we address the embodied carbon aspect of halving emission by 2030 from embodied carbon so we were doing uh, that together with arup and then on the circularity, I think as I wanted to flag because, of course, circularity is a key enabler of uh, embodied carbon reduction. The publication we from launched last year at COP on uh, the business case for circular building. So this is kind of the resources of uh, uh, that are related to the topic of embodied carbon. But also this is the work we are doing with the Global Alliance for Building and Construction on market transformation and what are the key levers to drive um, the decarbonization of the built environment and really the kind of key levers are taking our life carbon perspective low uh, cost and price at the same level and driving the supply and demand dynamics so these are i want to have last, last slide on a very brief and very uh, short cop 27 update i mean uh, cop 27 is still far and planning is kind of very much under the beginning but just for your information we hope the signal are good that there might be another built environment day or whatever will be the name at the COP. So for all of you to be aware that probably, hopefully they will be getting there. So, and uh, together with the Global Alliance for Building and Construction, we look, and Women Business, we're looking of maybe hopefully having again a built environment pavilion at the COP. So again, for your information to be aware of. And I what I wanted also to flag at, uh, of the building to COP coalition where uh, you see the organization we are collaborating with there will be the next uh, forum uh, which is a monthly update about the cop uh, so it's to share information about what the progress is at the moment as i mentioned things are more still in the making but as things get closer there will be surely be much more right. information and relevant aspects that might be of your interest great that's all great Thanks, Luca. And Luca, I want to follow up with you about the COP. I've been talking to a, a little group of CLF uh, members in Egypt about potentially um, um, what's what's the relationship. How can um, how can folks from the building industry in Egypt help to support the um, the the work and the and the envisioning and the action that hopefully will be generated out of COP twenty seven. So maybe we can have a follow-up conversation Absolutely. about that. Yeah. I also want to really appreciate that first slide that you showed uh, about um, that was your transformation matrix. I think it's it's so incredibly important to see this, the work that we're doing in this context of it is about climate action, it's about nature action, it's about equity action, and it's about redefining the very the very notion of what is value, so that it's in a broader context of of creating a world that we all want to live in um, and not just a matter of a technical matter of reducing carbon emissions. So yes, thank okay. you. I will, I will tell our colleague that it's actually it, uh, it's very appreciated. So, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So then we have uh, Renilda is on the line, I think. Is that right? Are you still here? Actually, she may have dropped off. Um, so another person who's who lives in Europe, as a matter of fact, and I think you know Renil de Beck, um, Luca, but um, she's not here. So we're gonna um, move move ahead then. Uh, Stacy, Stacy Smedley, much closer to home for me here in Seattle. Stacy from um, from uh, Building Transparency, uh, could you take it on and tell us what's happening with EC3 and sure. a, a realm of other things that are happening at, on on your uh, on your watch there. Sure, yeah. Um, so let me just share my screen. I just want to talk briefly about a couple of things that have happened or been um, been shared since the last call. Um, the first is work that we've been work, uh, doing uh, with funding around um, creating impact uh, level uh, ranges of data for major materials, uh, and it starts with concrete and steel. Um, so on our website, I can put this in the chat. We've published our methodology and results for doing this analysis for um, concrete and steel products. Um, what this is starting, like the shape of this is really that we're creating um, 
uh, LCA data sets for major materials across all impact stages uh, that could be used in uh, life cycle assessment tools, similar to how we open up the EPD database uh, in EC3, um, publish the methodology, publish the modeling, and then do a whole bunch of assessments with the results, uh, comparing industry EPDs, product EPDs, and then our, our modeling of what's really possible with all the scenarios of each product type. So. Um, we're really proud of this work. I don't want to go into all the details, but um, just a couple of the key things that we do uh, for each of the materials we're looking at, again, is the modeling. Um, it's parameterized modeling based on um, open LCA with some, some work that we've done on top of it to understand all of the scenarios for something like galvanized steel sheet, what our collection of product EPDs are currently telling us right now about steel sheet and where the industry EPD aligns um, mm -hmm. to really start to be able to analyze data at all those levels of specificity as well as be able to create results for all impact stages for each of those materials where you can start to see the, the different stages and the, the impacts of each stage um, for people to really understand that for each material type. Um, all of the documentation is on the website. Um, if you go into one of these, um, these documents, you're gonna see all of those results as well as just information about how we've done all of the, the modeling. Um, it gets pretty detailed. Um, but it's, if you really want to nerd out on concrete and steel production and all the different processes and the ways that you could, you know, modify things to get different results, um, it's all it's all in there. Um, and then the other thing that's really exciting about this work um, is the ability for us to actually um, be able to, to take the results and have anyone that wants to really play with the data and the impacts. Um, this is just a proof of concept, but this is for steel where you could start to play with the recycled content, uh, the electricity use, what kind of furnace, um, the processes. And if I uh, do this right, it's going to show you um, a result on the right. There we go, where it will start to change the, those results across the different impact categories and, and um, analyses for each of those different things that you change. So this is in progress, but really what we're trying to do is democratize now this next level of data um, around um, how we make materials. Um, more of this work will continue to develop with uh, timber being our next category. So we'll continue to publish results and we're, we're looking at funding to really expand this to more material categories and to more um, regions globally. Um, the other thing that we're doing right now is really trying to get a better idea. There's a lot of things going on around, um, and this is just something I'm working on right now, so it's not perfect around how uh, people are using EC3 uh, in terms of the database and the project planner. So this is just kind of a snapshot right now of all the integrations we have in process um, where we're getting you know, the inputs of data from different uh, locations, either digitally or not, and then exporting that data into all sorts of different tools for, for use. And this is really, again, the mission of building transparency to democratize this data, have a central place where it's in a format that can be read into all sorts of different tools and databases. Um, and then enable project level accounting that is, is playing with the tools that do that kind of modeling and work. So this will go on our website and also be something we can share as we get it finalized. Um, but this is really our first effort to really put in put place all the different things that uh, is currently going on with um, EC3 and the database and the project planner. Um, I'll stop there just with kind of current current things we're working on, but I think that you know continued adoption. We all know how fast this stuff is moving. You know we're over twenty three thousand users now in seventy countries. Wow. And, um, are starting to get a lot of uptick in um, Asia, Australasia, and, and Europe and the use of the tool, thanks to some owners that are now requiring its use globally. So um, it's all of us are making this happen. So it's just amazing to be on this journey. And it's far outperformed uh, my expectations at this point. Wow, Stacy, that was fantastic to hear. That was a really great report. So thank you. And next we've got uh, Ken Levinson from uh, the Passive House Network. Tell us what's happening in your world. All right, thank you, Andrew, good to be here. Um, and uh, I, I guess a good segue, we have a uh, carbon, uh, embodied carbon emissions tool, uh, the, the pH ribbon, which uses the EC3 database. Just thrilled to see our, our little graphic there, Stacy. And um, uh, which is we're getting great uptick in, uh, in interest um, and, and usage. And really what we're focused on is the American passive house market. Um, and, and it's a tool that integrates uh, embedded carbon emissions calculation with the operational energy calculation that they're already doing in the passive house planning package uh, so that they can get a sense of complete building carbon emissions over the life cycle of the building. Um, 
So that's uh, just to briefly mention that. My only real news is we have an upcoming national conference um, on June 10th, which will be all virtual. And then June 17th, a week later, in person in Boston, but also virtually held. And relating a little bit, I think, to what was, what was said just previously um, was what we're looking to do is increase the context and make the connections between passive house, between energy efficiency, uh, electrification, embodied carbon emissions, and social equity. Uh, and the conference is really organized around these themes and not uh, just having it be a geek out on passive house energy efficiency and all the technical uh, issues around it. And we're happy to have on the 17th in person in, in Boston, a panel dedicated to embodied carbon emissions uh, that will be moderated by Julie Janiski from Borough Happold in, in Boston. So um, really glad to put that forward and, and integrate it further. Um, and lastly, a side note, I'm also a proud owner of Build Beyond Zero. <laughs> Arrived uh, in the mail this week. So I haven't had a chance to read it in depth, but I've flipped through it and it's very impressive. And I, I can't wait to dive in and happy to recommend it. Everyone should get one. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. I understand it's great bedtime reading. <laughs> Anytime reading. That's what I've heard. Oh, thanks, Ken. So then we've got uh, Peter Backus uh, from the Port of New York, New York, uh, New Jersey. Uh, Peter, um, there are some really fantastic things happening in your world that I've, that I've, uh, as I understand it. Yeah. So uh, first of all, hello everyone. It's great to be here. I'm taking uh, Dorian Bailey's place due to conference that she had today. Uh, what the Port of New York, New Jersey has been working on is we've had an outstanding academic study in low carbon concrete. It's been taking place over the past six months or so. Uh, the first report, which will be able to be shared soon, we're just working through the internal workings of actually getting it out there, um, was in regard to quantifying the embodied carbon from the A1 emissions. Uh, the larger scope of the low carbon concrete pilot is that they're quantifying the carbon associated with these new mixes, they're identifying new low carbon mixes that are using high SCM use, new types of cements, new types of SCMs, um, and then doing performance testing to see, you know, will it meet the Port Authority's requirements? Um, so I can quickly share my one screen for uh, something that uh, we think will be really helpful for many agencies. Uh, I'm new to Zoom, so please tell me if you can see this. Yes, but yes. Uh, Okay, great. So in any case, these are emission factors associated with A1 emissions for concrete. Effectively, uh, what you can do if you don't have any B is you can just take these emission factors per your raw materials, multiply it by the amount of uh, the pounds of the material in your mix design, and you can create your A1 GWP, which as also part of the first section of the low carbon academic pilot, uh, it corresponds uh, they did a statistical analysis to align it with EPDs, and it corresponds pretty close. So, you know, you can either look at the A1 EPD if an EPD exists, or you can use these calculations. Both will get you the same uh, value. So it's something that uh, we internally have found massive values from. Uh, we are getting ready to start shopping around uh, concrete carbon limits associated with A1 emissions to our local industry to get feedback before we go ahead and do it concrete spec update in the coming months. Uh, and part of that will be including these emission factors and a GWP calculation for our general contractors and our producers who are not yet been able to onboard EPD software for whatever reason, so that they can also still report their embodied carbon. Uh, so that's a quick overview of what we're doing. Um, yeah, please feel free to ask any questions. Great, thank you so much. And uh, next person on our agenda is Melissa Morency from the AIA, um, who, by the way, was uh, she just had a, a great uh, feature article in the CLF newsletter about the, the new uh, AIA CLF embodied carbon toolkit for architects. Um, but so, Melissa, tell us what's happening in your world. Sure. Um I was really hoping to have a better update this time, but we are 
Some of you may know we started uh, tracking embodied carbon in the DDX as a part of the 2030 commitment. Um, unfortunately, not all of the large firms met our uh, deadline for reporting this year. So we haven't finalized all of our data, but uh, as we see it right now, we have doubled the amount of firms that have reported embodied carbon into the DDX this year, making it over a hundred, um, which is exciting for uh, those leading firms. Um, we will be hosting a webinar in early fall to dive deeper into the data that we have collected around embodied carbon in the DDX and looking forward to increasing that engagement in the future um, and hopefully coming up with even better information regarding that um, in 2023. That, that is all I have at this time. That's great. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Melissa. And uh, incidentally, on the MEP 2040 steering committee, we've had a the beginning of a conversation. One of the challenges that when building designers need to report on their progress toward low emissions targets, um, they potentially have a report to the SC 2050 for structural engineers, a report to the DDX for uh, for uh, for design. Um, uh, for embodied carbon related to building design and potentially now a report to the MEP 2040 initiative on, on progress related to MEP systems. And so one of the questions that came up was how we could potentially integrate all of that so that design firms and, uh, and uh, so structural engineers, um, MEP engineers, architects, and uh, and contractors would all have the same place to go to think about well how do we how are we decarbonizing both operational and body carbon um, really yeah. interesting idea <laughs> we've had some questions around that um, and how we can help because I do think that our platform and our process is a little further along than some of the other yeah. commitments that are out there right now um, so we've talked to both the structural engineers and I think it was mentioned earlier that to me P twenty 40 as well on how we might be yeah. able to exist. So we're looking into that internally and hopefully we'll have uh, news on that in coming months. Yeah. Cool. So next we've got Nikita Reed from the Zero Net Carbon Coalition. And thank you for hanging on this long. Yeah, uh, no problem. <laughs> no problem. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I am filling in for Lori Ferris, who is typically here for most of these meetings, um, but it's great to be here and I've been really enjoying learning what everyone is doing around the world. Um, so let me just share my screen real quick. Are you seeing the calculator, carbon avoided retrofit calculator screen? It's, it looks like it's trying to, there it is. Now I can right, see great. Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, so the zero net carbon collaboration for existing and heritage buildings, long name, we know. Um, but we really are at the intersection of trying to get existing and historic buildings more into the climate action conversation. One of the ways that we're doing that um, is Lori, Larry, and Aaron McDade, these lovely people down here. Oh, sorry. Um, they have been working on developing a carbon calculator to help developers and build owners have a better understanding of um, what happens to the carbon if they demolish an existing building and decide to build a new one. Um, in most cases, it's actually, you're going to save more carbon if you renovate, deep green re renovate um, the existing building that's already there. And so this tool is really just being developed as a way to help share and um, show that a little bit more uh, concretely. Uh, we also do, oh, sorry, Zoom is blocking my thing. Okay. Um, we also have a calculator, or sorry, a calendar on our website that is trying to really aggregate a lot of the different events and things happening um, with organizations that are dealing with retrofits, green um, renovations, etc. And so, you know, there's Past House Network on there, Architecture uh, 2030, the uh, Net Zero Build, AIA Convention. Um, so we're doing our best to try and aggregate a lot of events that are happening across uh, the industry. Uh, we definitely don't do this in a vacuum. And so we have a number of organizations that are part of the steering committee. Um, and this is actually a little bit outdated because we still need to get Carbon Leadership Forum as well as um, 
New Buildings Institute and a couple other organizations um, onto this list. But basically, we meet quarterly with our steering committee. We meet every other month with the membership. And then um, we're working on case studies and really providing resources to try and provide more tools and um, information for people looking to get into this space. Uh, I'll put a link to the organization website in the chat and would love to have anyone ask any questions or connect. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Nikita. And I already put a link to the uh, to the oh, care great. page on your on your on the ZNCC website, as well as a link to the um, the care tool and ZNCC are perfect. Something that You're on top of it. Great. We, thank you. We uh, strongly support and and uh, want to help that initiative any way that we can. Um, so then we move on. We're almost we're coming near the end of the meeting here. We've got uh, Jamie is please correct me once again if I get this wrong. But Jamie is it Jamie Van Moore? Van Moore. Yes. All right. Good. And you or are. Is, is I this, also. Yeah, I also go by JVM, which makes it a lot easier. JVM. Everyone gets. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy's Building Technologies Office. Great. I'm actually doing a fellowship with the residential team. So I'll provide an update on uh and this is very, very brief, so I'm glad I'm one of the last folks, but this is yeah. certainly an update for the federal staff members that are uh, starting to look into this embodied carbon world. Um, but I, I want to just say that I've been taking a lot of notes and just hearing about what all the other organizations are doing on this front is so incredibly helpful because the building technologies office is really just doing at this point a landscape and gap analysis study they're very interested in understanding all the data and the tools that exist out there um, as they um, try to figure out you know how this study helps to inform a building decarbonization strategy for the department of energy and of course the work that's happening um, when it comes to emerging technologies and all the market transformation activities. So, you know, that's pretty much it. I will also share that um, as part of my fellowship, I am working with the Zero Energy Ready Homes program. So that is DOE certification program, labeling program, um, which is more stringent than the Energy Star program, but not as stringent as uh, Passive House. Uh, we are looking to include uh, reporting for a new CO2 index, which the organization ResNet is going to be launching in July. So that's only operational emissions, but we know that embodied carbon is the next frontier and we're starting to have home builders that are interested in asking us questions. So, you know, what's happening in Canada, super, super helpful to see that, the tool and how you're engaging with home builders. So again, you know, we're very much in that collecting stage. And so any resources that you think be helpful for the Department of Energy to see, uh, please feel free to share them. I will throw my email into the chat. And again, I just appreciate everything that everyone's sharing. I feel like I'm taking a course in embodied carbon and uh, you are all the instructors, and now I have a textbook uh, to go ahead and uh, check out at Island Press. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Jamie. And in, in that regard, I think of myself as the TA. I'm the teacher's assistant, and all of you are the teachers. <laughs> so, I've, so I've got a lot of bosses here. Um, and then I think the last person on our agenda is Rebecca Esau from, uh, from uh, RMI. Um, and uh, and uh, you can also introduce your newest employee, a guy named CM, I think, something yeah. like that. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, nice to see everyone. And yeah, we are just so delighted to have Chris M join our team. Um, so thanks. Thanks, Chris, for saying yes to us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have some process updates, I guess, like not, not anything too big on our end. Um, regarding our policy work, we are almost wrapping up um, helping the state of Colorado set the global warming potential limits for all of the uh, material categories and subcategories that are included in, in their bi clean law. Um, and the, the team at Colorado is, is trying to be quite ambitious here. There are a lot of material categories that have not yet been included in any bi policy so far. 
So it's great, um, but of course we are encountering lots of challenges with uh, the availability of disclosure data. Um, we're also providing some technical research on concrete, uh, specifically sort of local concrete supply chains um, for Open Air Collective, who is pushing the next iteration of the LECLA bill in New York State, as well as NECEC, who is um, introducing a, a concrete only by clean or LECLA style bill in Massachusetts. Um, and then we've also partnered with C40 Cities. I don't, I didn't see Cecile on the call today, but we're working with her um, to run these four intensive workshops in June. This will be for um, city representatives and the topic is all about integrating embodied carbon into climate action plans. So we're really excited about that. We've done outreach and we've had some really great um, responses from cities big and small all across the nation. And then just my last update is um, for our federal work, we're wrapping up an embodied carbon roadmap for federal buildings that basically includes an analysis to identify different paths to zero uh, embodied carbon by 2050. Um, we are not yet ready to share that. Um, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to do a public release of this um, in, in the summer. And it'll be a resource that can be used not just for federal uh, buildings, but also like applicable to large, you know, uh, private portfolios as well. So we're, we'll be excited to um, release that in the summer. Great. And that's it for me, Andrew. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And I'll, I'll just point out here that one person who has not had a report here today, uh, uh, her name is actually P Pamela Conrad. But I have been her, I have been informed by a little tiny bird that the next meeting that we have, Pamela will have a really exciting, cool thing to report uh, to all to us all on. So with that as our conclusion this morning, thank you so much, all of you, for participating um, in this meeting. Unless Pamela, you wanted to say hello. Well, I would love to say hello to everyone. And um, I could just give a couple of updates, but I promise something more exciting next okay. time if you have That's another good minute. Enough. Um, just a couple of things to share. Um, that's happening right now. So I've been, um, I'm taking the lead for developing the American Society of Landscape Architects Climate Action Plan, um, something I suggested that be done about five years ago. And you all know what happens when you raise your hand and make a suggestion, um, <laughs> and, uh, doing it sometimes. So that's exciting. It's gonna come out um, and launch in our conference in November. And it's really a follow-up to um, the international commitment that we launched at COP26 last year. So. We made these big commitments about, you know, 75,000 landscape architects around the world committing to um, improving their embodied operational carbon and increasing carbon sequestration. And now we actually really need to provide the guidance and how we're going to do it. So um, that those action plans are really going to help people implement um, those strategies and um, also advancing the tools as well. So we've been um, working with the Atlanta Beltline Inc. to um, improve the Pathfinder app that I developed. So we've been adding a whole bunch more new materials to it. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, it's, a, it's an app on, and I can link the website, um, that measures embodied operational um, carbon and sequestration for everything outside the building. Um, and so that's um, happening. We've also been collaborating with C40 cities as well. So working to, you know, broaden it from just you know, kind of traditional landscape architecture into the planning realm and also hoping to get into integrating civil engineering as well. So thinking basically so many of you have buildings covered, we really need to get everything outside of the buildings included and covered as well. And so working to expand those collaborations. If anybody is a civil engineer that would know that would like to collaborate, please shoot their information to me as well. I'm trying to get um, more civil engineers um, included. And then the last thing is that um, through the C40 work, um, actually been collaborating with the with Toronto, um, and they're actually going to be the first city that is integrating, um, um, I guess, codes now, or it's in their new green building standards um, to um, set guidance for landscapes and planning to um, improve their operational embodied carbon and sequestration. So it's sort of the, the first city 
that's taken the step and actually implementing it in their um, code and green building guidance. So that's really exciting. Um, that's it for me. Great. Well, thanks, Pamela. I'm actually really glad that you decided to uh, give us a little, a little bit of a taste uh, of what's what's happening in your world. It's, you know, the whole idea that that we're not just talking about um, a little tiny area when we're talking about the building. We're talking about the entire building, all of the building systems, all the building materials, the the landscape that surrounds the building, um, and all of the infrastructure that connects one building to another. Um, so it's it's a it's a, a a really big holistic understanding of the built environment, uh, not just about buildings. And finally, uh, and and actually before we go, I wanted to make a point of welcoming Sarah Dominey from WBCSD. I think this is the first meeting that you've joined us, um, and I'm really happy that you could do that this morning. Well, this morning for me, it's probably not not morning for you. Did you want to say anything, something uh, uh, to, to everybody before we hang up here? Uh, yeah, thank you. No, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's Friday evening here, so just the start of the weekend. Um, and I just, I actually just joined the team this Monday, so everything is super new to me. And you know, I'm really getting getting to grips with all of the various partners. So it was really, really interesting to hear. So I've got a little cat with me. <laughs> Um, it was really interesting to hear, hear everyone's projects and particularly um, seeing case studies actually really, really nice. So um, thanks very much. I'm going to, probably going to be working uh, more in the kind of finance aspects with the built environment team here, um, but I'm sure that we'll cross paths at some point. So thank you. Great. Great. Thanks a lot, Sarah. And actually, there's one another person who hasn't had a report on this call, but is another new person, uh, the first time that Megan Kalsman has joined us for the NGO round uh, NGO roundtable. And uh, Megan, another of the three Megans who are now part of the CLF staff, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and the work that you're doing on the on the staff here? Definitely. Hi, everyone. So nice to hear all of your reports today. Um, so I am Megan Kalsman. I just recently joined with the CLF as well. And I'll be working with Megan Lewis on policy. So working specifically on policy research, I recognize a few of you that we've had meetings so far. Um, so yeah, super excited to connect and thanks so much. Great. And Anthony Hickling, you've been hovering around the edges here. If you don't mind, would you uh, please uh, take us out? You'll be the final person to talk on this call. So you've got a big job of uh, summing up the, the entire meeting in 30 seconds or less. That's a big job. Um, I've been on my phone the whole time, so I've just been kind of in the background. But hi, everybody. I think that I've met a lot of the people who are on the call today, maybe not everyone, but um, I'm Anthony Hickling. I, I guess a quick introduction might be useful. I'm the managing director of the Carbon Leadership Forum. A lot of the work that I'm doing is around making sure that embodied carbon action is able to scale and that the CLF is helping lead a lot of the research that makes that possible and also connecting with the right partners and organizations like you all who are on the call to fill in all of the gaps that are needed. So it's been really great to hear about all the reports. I think that um, it feels like 50% of what people were talking about was tools today, which is really exciting. I think that we have at least heard about most of them, but maybe not all of them. So that's something that I wanna check on afterwards. And um, it's just really exciting to see all the work that everyone's been um, been leading especially over the last quarter and what's kind of coming up embodied carbon action continues to just be an exciting um frontier for climate action right now and i'm excited to be with you all yeah great thanks a lot anthony and i also am excited this is i just love these calls because you get these reports from people all over the world working on really incredibly important and highly leveraged things that will make a difference um, so thank all of you for being here this morning. I'll make sure that the recording of this, the video recording of this call, as well as um, the list of all of the participants and the links that all of you have put in the chat window during the call are recorded and shared on the CLF community, the online community. Um, and we hope that all of you will be active on that community and, and make sure that you've got an account set up there. Uh, so with that, thank you so much. And uh, everybody who's on the West Coast, we can go off and get our second cup of coffee for the morning. And those of you who are in Switzerland can go out to dinner. 
And we'll see you all in a couple of months. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. everyone. Thanks, bye. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.